everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, a podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, game masters, novices, and masters alike. Wow. And of course, Dan. My co-host is, of course, Josh. I go away for vacation for a few days, and, and you, you... I got you, wordy. You buffed it out. <laughs> I got wordy. That's all. Because I haven't touched anything in a while. So on today's podcast, we'll be discussing all things quizzical and reciprocal, and eventually we're going to get to masks, the non-surgical, but mythical kind as well. So by all means, if you have any questions for us, we have some emails to get to first off. But if you have any questions for us, especially Josh, please email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com and we'll get to you. Until Before, then, until then, sorry, Josh has one to clarify. Yep, one one time. real quick. Um, I had uh, mentioned in two episodes back, I think it was the last email episode that we did. Yes, two episodes um, back. Somebody had a question about the shaman up today. spell. Yeah, so the the shaman spell that allows the caster to turn into any non-magical beast, and the question was, what does that count as? I did a follow-up with Morgan after we had recorded that. See how good we are? And his answer was was more or less what I had said, and that is that we don't rigidly define it, um, and it's more or less left for the game master to decide if something seems broken to... Or will break their game. Work with your player. Yeah. To to work with the player and figure out something that will keep things decent. Make make everybody happy. And so whether something is broken or not will depend in part. I mean, by the time you get the spell, it was a seven circle spell. By the time you get the spell, your game is reason- going to be sort of moderately high mm-hmm. powered as it is. Um, and I suspect whether a particular creature is broken or not will depend on what else is going on in the game. Fair. So... Ta-da! There you go. Asked and answered. Look at that. Two weeks, three weeks, three weeks apart. We got to yep. an answer for it. So, <laughs> more or less, this was this was a case of you know answering off the the thinking process yeah. off the cuff and pretty much pretty much supported what I thought there was the case. So, <laughs> yay me! <laughs> so yes, if you have any questions as well, by all means, email us. We will get to them. We've gotten to every single one of them so far. So on to one from Jesse, and I like Jesse's email because he's this is the reciprocal part because he has something to inform us oh on. yeah this one came in this one came in like the same day that the, that the episode went up this was also the one from yes. from two weeks back uh as our as of the yes. release of this episode the previous um because it was the one we talked about trolls yes so good morning dan and josh i'm a huge earth on fan i've been playing on and off since about 1995 i picked up listening to this podcast as well as the legends of earth dawn actual play podcast during the current covid pandemic and have greatly appreciated the continuous stream of earth on content and discussion kudos to all of you Kudos to you because you get like a double dose of Josh on both of, the, <laughs> both of these podcasts and, you know, we're in good shape. Uh, this morning I was listening to the just released episode 35 and your discussion of troll line marriage. In addition to being an Earth Dawn fan, I also happen to be an anthropologist. Congratulations to you. I believe the cultural reference you were looking for might be one from the Tibetan highlands. In that culture, a woman marries more than one man, usually a set of brothers, in that case, it often serves the functional purpose of preventing land inheritance to be split among the male heirs of a family. By having the brothers all marry a single woman, it means that a set of brothers can remain as one household. It also helps to reduce population growth in a resource-scarce environment, as a limiting factor in human procreation is the gestation. A woman can carry only one child normally at a time, unless they have twins, while males can fertilize a nearly unlimited number of females during the same period. So... While the purpose may not be the same, and I believe a troll line marriage can include more than one woman, I believe this is the closest cultural reference I, it could be calling on. All the best, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. That's awesome. First off, thank you, Jesse, for that <laughs> insight. I remember that email came in and I read it. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I like this is the this is a first for us on the show, which is great, where we were looking for an answer and we didn't have it, and one of our listeners had it. And provide Hence that to us. Reciprocity. That is so. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's that's really cool. I have no idea whether that's where the writer took that inspiration Fair. from, but the fact that it's Tibet, which is a very mountainous mm-hmm. region, which is very similar to yes. the trolls, and the idea that it could potentially, like, it's not addressed in the in the Earthdom material, but it could be something that would affect, you know, household, clans, family dynamics, you know, dynasties and things yeah. like that, and potentially limit population growth like those all fit really really well with the idea of the troll mountain highland culture in terms of that so i think that's really i agree cool. that was an awesome answer and jesse absolutely appreciated i love when 
games in general can occasionally teach things. And so if anyone was stuck on the same thing Josh was stuck on during that episode, line marriage, what does that actually mean? Where does that come from? You know, hey, we have an anthropologist. An anthropologist actually answered us. Congratulations. So we have gamers that are, you know, really, really smart and have lots of school behind them. So Jesse, absolutely love it. I love your Tuskrang name. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, Falal Katan, I'm assuming is Tuskrang, but it's just awesome. So keep writing in. Does it have extraneous uh, apostrophes? Uh, one each. Falal. One each. Okay. And then yeah. Katan. Yeah. So one, one apostrophe each name. Okay. <laughs> so yes, extraneous that apostrophes. Is, that is acceptable. I like that. Yeah, it works for me. Second email we got from Corey. Or he's on, yes, di- uh, on Discord as Grey Wolf, so go look him up. Uh, don't harass him because oh, he's yeah. got great questions. Hi, Dan. Hey, Josh. No, no, he's on, he's on the hey, pass of Discord. Corey again. I have a few more thoughts I want to share. First off, I wanted to say I, that I have really enjoyed the weekly episodes. I'm all cut up, but recently decided to go back and re-listen to the episodes from the start. Wow. You are really bored. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm up to episode nine, and I figured I should send in what thoughts and questions I had so far. First off, I wanted to offer my appreciation for shutting down trash-talking other games. I personally am a fan of a lot of games, including Pathfinder, and it is very tiresome and annoying having to constantly weather the negativity that other people throw at games they don't like. Lift up the things you love, don't trash the things you don't. Here, here. There you go. Uh, What do you think of the idea of using the Earth Dawn rule system, disciplines and all, in a different setting, either homebrew or pre-existing? I don't have any specifics in mind, it was just more the thought I had while listening. He's got more, but we'll get to um, it one, one question at a time. Yeah. This is, this is a good discussion. It, boy, I think if somebody wants to tackle that, that's awesome. One of the stumbling blocks of Earth Dawn in terms of potentially getting a wider fan community, I think, is because it is so, like many 90s era games, is so deeply entwined with its setting. Fair that it can be difficult to take the, the mechanics, which build a lot of the metaphysics and way that the setting works kind of so kind of integrated mm-hmm. and place them in another area. Because at that point, you're looking at something that is essentially earthed on philosophically, but lacking the some of the some of the strong setting underpinnings of that. I think it's perfectly fine and valid to do. Yeah. One of the things that we are aware of in our sort of development space as we try as we look at areas outside of Barsay for development, be that Kriana, Arancia, Elven Nations, you know, any other Cathay, although we're not looking at doing anything with Cathay right now, but aware of Cathay as a thing, is mm-hmm. how do we make this area still recognizably Mm -hmm. earthed on, but not have it be just, oh, we've taken all of the stuff and setting baggage, for lack of a better term, from bar save and just dropped it in a new location. Mm -hmm. And that's a difficult thing to wrestle with sometimes. Um, And what do you do? How do you make it distinct? And trying to balance the... Well, it's different from bar save, but bar save is so rich and fleshed out yeah. that anything that you try and develop that's different from that will potentially feel less coherent. It's not really the right word, but three dimensional, distinct, de- developed, distinct. And then you kind of tack on the issue with how the provinces that are defined in, and described in the first edition of Theron Empire book, because they do not have the amount of space to get expanded and whatnot Mm -hmm. can feel a bit pastiche uh, in there in that regard. Fair. You know, the, the, the the worst defenders of them in general perception, I think are Talia and Marak and then probably Indrisia as the ones and whatnot. And nothing against Robin Laws, great writer. These are things that I have long said, uh, those parallels and similarities existed way back in the early days of the of the game as yeah. a concept. So, you know, it it's it's a matter of, you know, looking at that. I mean, in it's not exactly the same, but 1879, our mm-hmm. sister game, which is yeah. also based on the step system and takes many um, ideas and concepts mechanically 
Um, it doesn't have disciplines the way that Earthdawn does, because magic in 1879 is not at the level to really allow those to exist. But the character progression still has those kind of recognizable, like, tiers of character development um, and has many things that are very similar mechanically. And so that is, in a sense, kind of taking Earthdawn and, and dropping it into a new setting. It's not a one-to-one parallel, yeah. but... Yeah, it can absolutely be done. And if somebody wants to do that and, and develop their own setting to go with it, I think that's awesome. Yeah, you could grab a bunch of D&D settings, Greyhawk, Dark Sun, uh, Forgotten Realms, any of those, just to lean on D&D a little bit, or a Pathfinder setting, Savage Worlds. I think I had an Earth on crossover with Savage Worlds a while ago. Yeah, take it, just, just find the terrain maps and the locales. Use all that stuff if you want to keep the earth on yeah. disciplines and magics. Just go ahead. It's just putting it, you know, off another map somewhere. You want to take it to like Earth on's version of Australia? Knock yourself out in the outback. That'd be great. That's got to be horror. Team. That is a discussion for another time. <laughs> we, I mean, we talked about when we talked about orcs. We talked about the complexity and difficulty sometimes of dealing with real world representation in in yes. fictional spaces and in game spaces and i think visiting the earth on version of australia would be really really interesting but being mm-hmm. aware of the stumbling blocks of original theron empire book and the greater awareness of stuff like that like mm-hmm. it's it's the same as like wanting to visit and see what would be different about the americas in earth dawn because yes. there is reference to Arcania, I think, is the is the name of a of a Theron settlement that's in, I think, South mm-hmm. America, um, or equivalent of modern day South America. And yeah. wanting to be respectful of that and make sure that it's something that we're aware of. And the idea of, oh yeah, we should do Earthstone's like Australia, <laughs> like Earthstone version of Australia. And my thought is that would be really, really cool, but I oh boy. Like I would want to get, I would want to get native do we start? Aboriginal <laughs> voices involved with that. I would want to try and see what aspects Fair. of their cultural legacy could be adapted for Earth Dawn in a respectful way. You know, things like that. I already have. The, I already have the tagline. It's under Dawn. Um. <laughs> so. I, I think one of the one of the strengths of bar save in, in one sense is that it is to borrow a phrase from D and D. It is a it is very much kind of a points of light setting. Is that there are large swaths of mm-hmm. undefined, unexplored area that it is very easy for a GM who wants to develop his own setting to still be able to set that in bar save. That we don't have every hex of the map filled in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, my friend created his own. And he took it between Cathay mm-hmm. yeah. and Bar Save. And that's where he set his. Since I pointed out to him that the actual Bar Save map is on planet Earth, certain, you know, Eurasian location, he found another spot that he liked as well. And it's got a river and the whole nine yards and a nice little two, couple of valleys and a nice little desert. So he took it and he planted it right smack dab there and said, that's where I'm going to base my location. So if we traveled west enough, we'd get to Bar Save. If we traveled east enough, we'd get to Cathay. So he put them right between the two. And I have to and, say, as I'm looking at, at starting work on the Europa book and looking at the people from across the RSC, I'm looking at the map and saying, what part of the world is that? And what's interesting mm-hmm. that we could, that I could do, could do there. Anyway, so yeah. no. Anyway, the next so, question. Do it. Have at it. Uh, when he reached episode three, a listener email asks about campaign level plots. Considering his re listen is occurring after the announcement of Empty Thrones, he found our responses amusing and how much we were trying to answer honestly without revealing anything. How hard is it at times like that to keep quiet instead of gushing about the cool thing you're working on? Well, see, Josh has sworn me to secrecy because I'm not actually working on it. And so I just kind of blather on and no one takes me seriously because I'm not working on the actual project. Josh is kind of like, after the episode's over, he's like, you know, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't have mentioned yeah. this. Oh, I, did, I said that? Sorry. No, that's no. It, and I, I completely. Unaware. It is a mix of both. I really want to talk about the cool stuff that we're working on, but there are times also where it feels really good to sort of be keeping a secret and, and being <laughs> coy and like, in, in the case of Empty Thrones in particular, I, I talked about this mm-hmm. actually on the, the Seize the GM 
episode yes. that I did, a, 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 they got released a week or so back, that I, like, we knew that was happening and were intentionally kind of feeding out the line uh, as things yeah, little were tidbits little, time. little tidbits or, or playing coy or, or doing stuff because the basically sort of the the the, the game within a game the announcement the the pr <laughs> the um the the timing of stuff it was just really like trying to really kind of work into a okay we actually have some sort of like ongoing plan as opposed to well we're just kind of throwing stuff out at the wall yeah no, in well, in in, was, in, the, in the case of that, it was like it was partially coordinated. You had the the graphic novel yep. final page come out at the same time we did the podcast at the same time the Kickstarter launched. So you, it was kind of a coordinated oh, marketing yeah. effort to go. We can't say anything until this thing comes out announcing it. And it was you know it it's really nice to like see people speculating and to be able to make comments and like it, it was just it was a lot. It was kind it was fun. It was fun to have that interaction <laughs> um, and to go back, you know, because episode three would have been the very tail end of 2019 um, mm-hmm. or thereabouts when we were like really working on that and knowing that it was coming and just being like, hmm, could be, <laughs> you know, that's a fascinating question. I, I wonder if we are going to do anything like that. Hmm. So, and I, I think last week, two weeks ago, we mentioned that uh, Rusty's writing some novels for Earthon, so those are coming as well. The yep. graphic novel for Champions Challenge is, you know, coming as right. well. Right. So yeah. It's not like we've kept many, many secrets; just a couple. Yeah. Well, the the, so, the yeah. Rusty the Rusty novel things is not a, a secret that we have been keeping. It's just that because of life and whatnot, his production on those got delayed slash backburnered in in a certain extent, and hopefully. Yeah. You know, we've got the first one. Hopefully, we'll be able to see forward progress and and be able to get those out. So, no, uh, Josh is more than happy to share what he can <laughs> with what's coming down the pike. I, so, I, yeah, yeah, we we like to joke about Andy being the mean one that won't let us talk about anything, but she is equally <laughs> as, as eager to play the game, as it were, as as mm-hmm. the rest of us. And and I like sort of occasionally playing the mysterious, all knowing. Um, <laughs> wizard all knowing boss. wizard, yeah. <laughs> Behind the curtain. Uh, so as Corey was prepping for uh, his upcoming game, he was running. He ended up running to the Discord channel for help with understanding astral space. They helped him answer the question he had, but it got him thinking about an episode on astral space and how adepts can interact with it. Might be good for Josh and I to consider somewhere down the line. I think it's on the list. It's we we did gotta be yeah. If not, I'll put it on the yeah. list. So we have a bunch yeah, of things we've, to we've got. So, but yes, I I agree. Um, astral sensing and whatnot has undergone quite a few revisions over the years. Some of them at my own hand. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like especially the difference between third edition and fourth edition astral sensing. And Fair. yeah, we can put it on the list. Not exactly sure when Absolutely. we'll get to it. Yeah, I'll make sure to follow up on that one. Uh, a couple of mechanics questions, and then we're done with Corey's email, cool. which has gone on for like 10 minutes. Does the extra thread in an enhanced matrix count towards the limit of extra threads based on the circle that a magician can add to a spell? Yes. Next. So uh, so, but so <laughs> to, to expand more, to expand more coherently to make sure that I'm understanding his question. Or if you're not, then your explanation will help him understand his question, his Perhaps. own question. So let's go with that. So magicians can weave a number of additional threads based on their tier. Novice tier, which is to say circles one to four, they can weave one additional thread. Journeyman tier, they can weave two. Warden tier three, master tier four. When you get to journeyman tier and you get access to your enhanced matrices, you can take, if a thread is normally a zero thread spell, and put it into an enhanced matrix with an extra thread woven into it. And I think I actually mentioned this kind of okay. when we when we talked about this. Like when I got to Journeyman Tier with Virag, my Nethermancer, the question is, mm-hmm. okay, Astral Spear, which is a one thread range damage spell, and Spirit Dart, which is a ranged zero thread damage spell that has a little bit less damage. Mm-hmm. Like there are some differences between them, but I could put Astral Spear into the matrix and have its normal one thread pre-woven so that I could cast Astral Spear every round, or, which would be will plus four with Mm -hmm. extra successes adding to the damage, or I could put 
spirit dart into that matrix with a pre-woven spell for added effect to make it also will plus four, so that basically they're uh, doing equivalent damage like every round on those. It's just that spirit dart has a little bit shorter range and has a secondary effect yeah. that goes along with it. And that is in, in a few cases, like the, the, the extra threads kind of does that, that design is sort of intentional. It's not necessarily always accurate or, or like consistently equivalent in that regard, but that's mm-hmm. something that you can see. If you are doing that zero thread spell into an enhanced matrix and you are using, weaving, using that pre-woven thread as an extra thread, yes, it does count towards your normal limit for weaving extra thread. So if I had spirit dart with an extra thread in an enhanced matrix, I could weave one additional extra thread beforehand if I wanted to, but it does count against that limit. There you go. Okay. Since we're on thread weaving, does the bonus to thread weaving from some thread items Apply to all versions of thread weaving that a character has if they're multidisciplined. I believe so because, again, without going through and checking every single item to make sure that it's phrased <laughs> this way. Yes. Thread okay, weaving. It's a yeah. Question. Well, it's a simple question, but I need to qualify it because if I don't, somebody may come back and say, well, this item says this. I recognize that there are some differences in how things are worded, and that sometimes can cause some confusion, potentially. Yes. Thread item bonuses to thread weaving should be presented in in all of the cases as they provide a bonus to thread weaving tests, as opposed to most mm-hmm. cases of a talent bonus where they are actually adding ranks. Um, so, like, uh, a an item will provide bonuses will like provide a plus one rank to spellcasting, for example, which means that if your spellcasting rank is five from your from your normal talent rank and you have that item, it is effectively a six, meaning anything that is based off of rank is effectively a six as well for the purposes of everything except determining how you qualify for advancement. Thread weaving does not explicitly does not do that because otherwise by providing a rank bonus to your thread weaving that thread is then effectively paying for itself and no longer a factor in the thread in the limit of thread weaving in terms of the number of permanent threads that you can have woven so Ta-da. so so there are two possibilities one the item might say a bonus to thread weaving tests in which case it would apply to any thread weaving tests that the character has, even if they're multidisciplined and have multiple thread weavings. The other possibility is that it may provide a bonus to elementalism tests or nethermancy tests, in which case it only applies to that variety of thread weaving. Now, I think in most cases, the items that are in the books are broad Mm -hmm. or universal rather than being discipline specific, but it is possible that there might be items that are specifically created because of their association with a particular discipline in their history that they would only provide bonuses to that Fair. type of thread weaving. Usually usually spellcaster items. Yeah, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, because because the only the only thing that thread weaving for other disciplines is mainly used for is weaving threads to items. Good point. Okay. But yeah, uh, so so the general rule is it will provide a bonus to the tests regardless of which type of thread weaving it is, unless the item description and history pretty much specifically indicates that it should only be for elementalism or wizardry or whatever. Gotcha. If it doesn't call out a specific discipline thread weaving type by name, it would apply to any thread weaving tests, regardless of how many disciplines or thread weaving talents that the character might have. So unless it's specific, it applies to everything generic. Correct. (laughs) Again, like simple answer, but I wanted to provide the... Like, oh, you know, it needed some structure. You needed a it needed some structure. I wanted to I wanted to call out the like it doesn't boost rank because then it's paying for itself. And that can potentially go difficult places because then you can actually because then as you increase the rank, the bonus means you can then weave more items. Mm -hmm. And again, that goes potentially broken places. I mean, gotcha. maybe not super broken because you still have to pay legend points to weave all of those things, but it does mean that you are no longer necessarily required to make the choices between, oh, I want to use this item or I want to have a group pattern or whatever. Yeah, fair. 
Okay. So that wraps up the email portion of today's podcast. So we got through yes. two long ones, but we appreciate all of the questions because they did provide, hopefully, someone else an answer at the same time. And at least provided us an answer with the troll line marriage. That's so true. We're good there. It did. If you have your own questions, by all means, edsgpodcast at gmail.com. We'll do our best to answer them. And if we don't, hopefully when listeners can, like next time, like this time. So we'll see what we can get to. On now to masks. We actually get to crack open the companion book yeah for the first time in a while companion i went through and found like 14 different categories initially listed in the companion for masks josh has a sneak pre sneak peek actually i think he said he had some from the iopen source book yes well the iopos pdf has been released Mm -hmm. the official pdf has been released so this is available the print uh version we actually got a picture from the publisher uh, from the printer yesterday as we're recording this that showed mm-hmm. us basically um their proof like basically oh, yeah. what the book looks like when it's all been printed and folded up and stuff before they put the cover on oh yeah the bound um, pages so right like like all of that yeah but masks are cool <laughs> i take a drink everybody i was joking somewhere <laughs> so i think we're on talking, discord we're not talking the kn95 we're not talking any kind of bice licking mask or anything you need for covid these no. are we're talking about Earth Dawn masks. You get to alter creatures with, so you can kind of change up everyone's expectations on anything that they can encounter in yep. one of, and I'm just going to start with the initial 14, because each one of those has a subcategory. So right. like Astral has three, Cadaverous has three, Corrupted has five, Elemental Aspect, it has 27 alone. Well, yeah. That you can run into. Uh, elite mount is only one, but uh, a fast is three. Leader is two. Pack tactics is has three. Poisonous has three. Size has six different sizes. Four for skeletal. Uh, spell draining has three. Stealthy has three. And undead has four. So, right. And that's just from the companion. That's the, just from the, the companion. The purpose, of, the purpose of masks is to, yeah, it, it allows the, the, this is something that experienced game masters in any game system will often do on their own, which mm-hmm. is to say, take existing creatures and modify them or change them, whether it's a simple description or play with the numbers or whatever to yeah. throw some variety to change things up for, for their groups, particularly if they've been doing it for a while and are comfortable with the system. Masks provides a template upon which you can do that and have a rough idea for how that might modify roughly speaking the difficulty mm-hmm. of of the creature as an encounter it allows in much this in in a similar way to how the extra threads mechanic allows spells to have a longer lifespan for the player characters as their careers continue masks allow creatures to sort of have that same benefit for game masters mm-hmm. so that you know, lightning lizards or brithens or, you know, anything else Cave that crabs. kind of, you know, whatever. Um, well, and yeah, any creature <laughs> that, that might start off as being a challenge for lower circle characters, but mm-hmm. stops being one as they get into journeyman or even warden and, and master tiers, um, yeah. potentially allows you to basically what, what happens is let's say that there are, it, it allows a, a, a multiplicative effect in terms of the number of creatures that are potentially available for a game master, right? That if you've got like that, let's say that your creature pool normally is like 30 creatures. I know there are more than that, but let's say there are 30 creatures yeah. by having a couple of masks available that multiplies that potential creature pool. Let's say you just have one mask. You suddenly have not 30, but 60 potential creatures. You have a second mask. Mm-hmm. You've now got, 90 potential different creatures because one of the things that kind of sells well if you look at pathfinder dungeons and dragons creature books are hugely popular even if you only end up using you know a third of the creatures in any particular volume Mm -hmm. so masks allow creatures in earth dawn which tend to have a little i say tend to have a little bit more of a um, environmental ecological role niche that they fill without needing to oh you know mm-hmm. the scay orcs which is sort of an apex predator of 
the jungles of Barsave is no longer necessarily like a challenge, I need to now come up with an even more apex predator. And the more of those kinds of new creatures that you start throwing in starts to make the ecology of the area feel like random and stupid, potentially. Like that's one of the potential issues with like kitchen sink settings where you're just throwing everything into it is that, you know, you start to wonder, well, Mm -hmm. how is this all supposed to work? Truth is it doesn't, which is fine. But with a mask, you can take that Skeorx and throw, oh, this is just a bigger Skeorx. So it's got higher stats. It's a little bit more of a challenge, but, you know, you can kind of go, go from there. Yes. So that's, that's the purpose of, of masks. And, um, especially when you get into the elemental ones, it is allowing you to present different elemental themed creatures. Like you have, say, like you can just take a normal animal, like a bear. And you throw a, an earth elemental template onto it and you have mm-hmm. a Brithen, sort of. Like it's not actually, like it's an elemental <laughs> bear. Yeah. You know, or. Like an earth bear. Yeah. Or, or a water bear. Not a tardigrade, a water bear. Not a tardigrade. <laughs> <laughs> um, although a giant tardigrade thing would be weird. Anyway. I think a giant tardigrade should be in the game somewhere, but. Well, I mean. No, so these are, these are your built in variations. Yeah. Essentially. I mean, they're called masks because it's a nice, cool name and a, yeah, whatever. But I, these are your built-in variations. So how about we just run through the quick list for everybody? Yeah. And we can talk about the, the genesis or the thought process behind it. So only because they're alphabetical, let's start with astral. Mm-hmm. So you can slap an astral mask on creatures and it usually changes their appearance a little bit. You know, higher mystic defenses, of course, reduce physical capabilities because they're more kind of ethereal, I guess. Yeah, it, it it tends to give a little bit of a penalty to physical stats in exchange for mental stats um, in terms of like boosted physical defense, uh, boosted mystic defense over physical defense, boosted perception and willpower with maybe reduced strength and toughness. But it also gives them them astral sight. This would be something that, you know, so just sort of kind of gives yeah, a more otherworldly a, a little less, a little otherworldly a little less, bit less more, more yeah a little bit more fantastic. a little bit more mystical kind of this this would be sort of a a generic it is a magical creature a, yes. a, a kind of it's a it's a magical bear mm-hmm. yeah as a as opposed to something that is more specifically say elementally aligned yeah so i, I like the fact that it's just more astral and if you do the right one, maybe it has a little astral attack. Uh, down to cadaverous. And there's a distinction to make between cadaverous and undead, because I mentioned undeads at the bottom of the list. So they're similar. Um, cadaverous, so cadaverous mask basically, the, mask. yeah, the cadaverous mask is what you do if you want to make a cadaver wolf or a cadaver bear yeah. or like basically take any non person, like any non name giver. And, ma- and, yes. and a horror has made them a cadaver man version of whatever they are. And that's the general yeah. purpose of the cadaverous masks. They will, mm-hmm. for the most part, modify the, the, the stats a little bit, but mainly are adding the fury and enrage powers um, that, that are the hallmarks of the cadaver man, which is to say <laughs> that you cause a wound, they start doing multiple attacks and get bonuses to damage and have some, some damage resistant in terms of like ignoring wound penalties kind of thing. That's basically what the cadaverous yeah. masks are. I want to make the distinction before we get to the undead because it's all the way at the end. But and there's you know, three different versions of cadaverous as well. They're all very Yeah, cool. for for most of these for most of these masks that we're talking about, there will be two or three different versions um because you'll have one that is just basically applying the special abilities that go along to it with some minor stat tweaks that don't affect the circle mm-hmm. um and then you will have ones that increase the circle as well by basically providing bigger bonuses to the to the attributes and whatnot yeah and like so cadaverous one. yeah so like Sorry. cadaverous you've got the normal like you've got the 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 normal cadaverous which really is just more or less uh, like making them a little bit tougher in terms of higher death and unconscious rating, giving them the special cadaver man powers as, and then there's the major, which adds two equivalent, roughly two circles to the creature and yeah. adds much higher bonuses to all of the stuff, <laughs> you know, and is even, even nastier. Yeah. I'm just looking at the un- uh, unconscious and death bonuses to the major. Whew. Yeah. Plus 19 yeah. unconscious plus 22 death. Yeah. Um, and the, That'll the modifiers, this is 
obviously given as in the rules for the companion, but the modifiers that are there, you don't need to like recalculate other stuff. You just add them to the values as they are. You don't need to worry about like deriving all of the secondary stuff. That work has sort of all been done for you as so part of building very, the mask. Very quick math for all you game masters yeah. in a hurry. Uh, yep. Onto corrupted. So these have been corrupted by their environments and incidental exposure to the horrors. Uh, yeah. Than direct influence. And so they're just kind of ambient mutations along the way, more or less. Yep. This is your uh, Chernobyl catfish. <laughs> These are the ones that you would put on wildlife, say, coming out of the wastes or the badlands or par length, any area that that has suffered pretty heavily from horror corruption or the bloodwood um, or well, bloodwood. Yeah, um, perhaps that would be applicable as well. These also tend to you've we've you've got kind of got two different varieties in here. You've got the fast ones and the strong ones, mm -hmm. which is to say that that the fast ones have been warped to be more lean and um like emaciated and whatnot. Yeah, um, deformed like thin fast. and wiry and deformed yeah. in the sense that they will be very like stretched out and thin and very kind of skittery and fast as a result. Mm -hmm. And then there are the strong ones, which will tend to have like gotten bulky and have like armored plates and be more kind of like lumbery tanky. And you've got sort of varieties of both of those. These are also templates, you know, anything that is in an area that would have been subject to horror corruption, mm -hmm. explicitly not cadaver men not undead yes. but other kind of horror twisted or horror uh constructy type of modifiers on existing creatures yeah because these are all twisted by where they grew up not necessarily specifically a horror taint just yeah corrupted space corrupted natural well which is which is pretty much the result of the horrors yes. so these are these are the these are the masks that you would throw on for a creature that is to to basically indicate that the area that the group is heading into is tainted or corrupted or whatever in some fashion. Yes, exactly. Which because that's the other the other thing that you can do with masks is to use them to kind of thematically tie into what is going on and themes of the adventure. Yeah, and then we get into the really really big one because I took a look at this and I counted them. Elemental aspected masks, and there are twenty seven yes. different variations of this. Yeah, I'm not kidding because uh, there's air, earth, fire, water, wood, crystal, and so. Well, forth. yeah. So you've got so you've got a couple of different varieties of air, like and air and water. And like crystal. you've got you've got not just air, you've got cold, which is kind of which is water, but different yep. from you know it's it's cold water, it's frozen water, it's snow. The those are the ones that you would say like the like you would throw. Oh, these are ones that live on the high mountain peaks and are sort of connected with the snow and ice and so forth up there yeah you know crystal is a variant of earth you know kind of tied in with like the the living crystal and you know things like that of the crystal peaks um and so there are you know like a bunch of different varieties of elemental you've got metal you've got wood Storm. you've got you know you know yeah There's storm which is a which is a <laughs> sort of a variant of air you know, so you've all like the, the sort of with the electric aspect. And so that, that is by far the largest variety of mask because throwing different elemental aspects onto creatures turned out to be really cool can provide a wide variety. <laughs> of, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, yeah. it's kind of a gimme. I think the, the elemental aspected mask is. A, it's, as we said, it's the largest and the most varied, but I think that is one of the cooler applications you can possibly do is. Add mm -hmm. fire to something that doesn't have fire before, or would, you wouldn't expect to have fire. Add water to something you didn't, wouldn't expect to have water as well. And to, or storm. Take you know, take a yeah. griffin, make it a storm griffin. Well, Holy, one of the one things. of the ways, uh, one of the one of the sort of not directly pointed to, but subtle examples of using masks is mm -hmm. if you look at the creatures that are in the companion. There's like four different varieties of Aspagra that are basically just different, slightly elemental mm -hmm. variety or masked versions of the Aspagra based on where they're from. Yeah. And so that's like those are largely from using masks on the base Aspagra. So there you go. Example and noted. On to the elite mount, which is only one kind that's just because yep. whatever animal companion you can find that's a good mount is now elite. Right. Yeah. 
and and it just, just it just basically it just basically takes your your standard variety of the mount and makes it a little bit better. This works especially well and is partly intended to be used with Beastmaster slash Cavalryman yeah. Nax that. I don't remember whether they're actually in the companion or whether they're from the alternate animal companion rules that Morgan published, created, and has on his blog. Ah, fair. I think there is a knack. I should go check, but I'm not going to. I think there is a knack that allows you to apply a mask to an animal companion. And so Elite Mount is one of those that basically would be for that purpose. Fair. We can cover that when we cover knacks. Eventually. Who knows? On to Fast, which of course has three different kinds of speeds. (laughs) <laughs> yep. For, you know, fleet swift well, and yeah. like silver fast. So Right. They, and these course. and these generally generally provide initiative and physical defense bonuses. Mhm. Making making creatures a little bit more difficult for your fast acting warriors and or sword masters to to deal with. Yeah. Uh, makes them a nice challenge there if you've got like the the quick silver uh fast mask which provides a plus 6 to the creature's normal initiative. <laughs> They also get the dash power, which allows them to move farther and still attack in, in that regard. So that's cool. Yeah. So we're, on, we're only halfway through the list. We got leader. So basically, mostly, to, uh, I think, designed for pack animals. Maybe. Yeah. They, they, yeah, basically, they're for the, the alpha, to use a, a, a somewhat not completely accurate term. But if you're going to have a, a wolf pack or a, a troop of apes or gorillas or something like that, this is this is the template that you would provide to the silverback or the the lead dominant member. Yeah, the dominant member or whatever, because yeah. it it the elder, uh, the elder does, wolf of the pack. Yeah, the, the elder wolf leader. of the pack, the silverback gorilla, the um, you know any kind of of social or pack animal is one. This this would be the one that you would apply to. Yeah, what and would be the, the leader of them? Two, type, two types of leader masks. We're not going to go into both of them, but leading into the next one, actually, the pack tactics mask. Because right. you have a leader, you have a pack. So the pack tactics uh, has three versions as well. Actually, leader has two. Yeah, uh, pack tactics has three, and this is again the when they act as a group. So your right. wolf pack, your murder of crows, I think is that. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, not a bad way to use the that the, one. the 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 flock the flock of crackbills. <laughs> Not the craggle of crackbills, just kid. Flock of crackbills, um, the exactly. the the little known the the little known traveling troubadour group. Yeah, so flock of crackbills. When you, you want to have playing shadow playing mance. playing at uh, yeah yeah when you want to have shadow mance attack as a unit or your krill worms attack as a unit, pack tactics is a nice mask to put on there because uh, they 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 require fewer individuals to be at uh, to be attacking a target to apply harried penalties. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the higher level one, in fact, uh, they uh, have surprise strike as well. Always deadly. And distract for the higher one, um, because then it can sort of do that. Yeah, they will absolutely work as a pack. We've talked about distract using uh, talents for other disciplines. By mm-hmm. all means, they should be able to use it as a pack. On to poisonous, which of course poisonous. This is basically, I mean, pretty <laughs> yeah, pretty straightforward. This is adding poison to a creature. This gives what? the creature the ability to to deal poison. That's a cop out. That's just obvious. That's uh, I'm yeah. Well, teasing. pretty much. I'm teasing. Uh, and then there's six different versions of size, smaller in size and bigger in size. Of course, are the, are the main three. Yeah, yeah, this is know. this is one of the ones. Yeah, this is one of the ones. One of the few that has actual ones that reduce the the relative challenge rating. So yeah. you basically have younger or juvenile versions of a creature if you want to have say. You want to bring a Brithen into your adventure, but your group isn't quite high enough, then you just make it a smaller one. Yeah. That's all. And that's all you got to do. So, and, and that is, you know, there's nothing supernatural about it. They're just larger or smaller than normal. Yes. And my favorite one, because I have done adventures from way, way back when, and the ones, the adventures submitted to the Earth on Journal and whatnot were all fan made, and I love them, but they have skeletons. And finally, there's a skeletal mask you can apply to darn near any creature out of the books. So yep. if you want, yeah, you want to stick a dire on somebody or a uh, thunder beast, great, make it a thunder beast skeleton and stick that on them yeah. instead. Uh, this is similar to the cadaverous or uh, corrupted. These are ones that are 
sort of undead slash horror adjacent. You know, they're actually skeletal does have a version that reduces the difficulty a little bit because it's just a skeleton. And so like the cadaverous and corrupted masks basically allow you to have some sort of horror slash corrupted slash nethermantic related themes to the creatures that you might have in your encounters. Yeah, I have missed those. I look forward to uh, having skeletons either thrown at me because I'm playing 4th edition. I'm not running it yet, but I'm looking forward to those. Um, and then we've got three left. But the spell draining, I think, is a ni- nice little twist that sounds oh so very much Earth Dawn. If you have a group that is kind of a little bit more leans on the combat buffs and whatnot, the spell draining really gives um, the creatures the... Uh, it's kind of a spell resistance uh, effect. They tend to have willful, which makes them a little bit more difficult to control with magic like Dominate Beast or uh, Animal Bond. Um, but they also have Dispelling Strike. Um, they basically have the ability to oh, dispel magic. Yeah. You know, basically on unsuccessful, <laughs> on, on high attack rolls may make a dispel magic test against yeah. buff spells. These are these are the 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 sort of magic eating critters. Mm-hmm. This reminds me of the is it the Vesper Vespa something like that the, in, in one of the older editions where uh, any, the Volus anytime you came the Volus thank you anytime yep. you came near them you fell asleep. <laughs> no 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 okay no so we're thinking of different things you're thinking of the Veta oh, sorry. which was a herd Veta. animal that's what it is the Veta was like the gazelle like thing that would cause that would cause things near it to fall asleep but it was on a cycle. Like it was really strong at certain points of the day and really weak at others. I was thinking of the Volus, which is a creature Ah. that gets attracted by magic and will come and attack because it wants to, like it's it's got a magic sensing organ and it gets drawn to magic and attacks magical stuff. Both of them started with V. We were in the same ballpark. So, (laughs) and then there's the Gatehound and then there's the Gatehound as well, which has a sort of magic dampening um, effect. effect. So this is kind of along those, along those similar lines. Yeah, honestly enough, I've not used the Gatehound, but I probably should soon. Gatehound is cool. The, so spell draining's on there, and we've got two left. So stealthy, of course, should happen. Yep. Because this is just environmental. They've naturally camouflaged and adapted to moving around their environment better than most things. So that could seriously apply to anything, which is why it's a mask. And, I mean, we're yep. not kidding. Cloaked, shrouded, and shadow. So I don't want to come across a shadow brithen anytime soon. That would just be horrendous. <laughs> Yeah, these these masks basically sort of uh, attach um, ambush, stealthy stride, and when you get into the more powerful versions, um, they can regain surprise so that they can, you know, they basically add like sort of thiefy powers onto in terms of their their thing. Like you throw this on top of an already ambush predator type creature, and they get uh, they can get particularly nasty. Yeah, I. Uh, mm. Trying to figure out how that would work for a cave crab. And that just gives me shivers. And then lastly, we have the undead mask, which has four different versions as well. You have putrefied and fresh, rancid, and rotten. So, and those are out of order, by the way. And this is, and this is just sort of the generic, like, it's not a cadaver man. No. So in the sense the that it has the, it doesn't have the berserker stuff that the cadaver man does, but it is otherwise undead. So they get, you know, basically immunity to fear, resist pain. Uh, at at higher levels, they they stink and so potentially provide uh, harried penalties to people fighting them. These are the Monty Python like definition of mostly dead. Yeah, well, they're they're dead. They're no <laughs> they're longer. Dead. Not they're they are no longer communi- um Yeah, no longer animal companion suitable. But yeah, this is just sort of the generic. It's not skeletal. It's not a cadaver man, but it's undead. Yeah, just kind of generic. I can already guess that some nethermancer somewhere, and you're playing one, Virag, might want to take an undead or a cadaverous as an animal companion. So we've already put, we've, we've put the kibosh Except on. that those are not, yeah. I mean, as the undead one here says, these creatures are generally no longer suitable as animal companions or mouse. Yes. So. And they are no longer considered creatures for the purposes <laughs> of most talents and are undead. Like they basically, that, that, changes them from being creatures and therefore subject to Beastmaster talents. Yep. And changes them to undead, which then makes them so vulnerable to Nethermancer talents and abilities. Yes. So just want to lay it out there. Don't want any emails about, hey, can I? No. 
No. <laughs> I mean, if your game master wants you to, you know, if you can work it out with your game master. Sure. Um, cause it's thematically appropriate. That's cool. Um, another mancer would be more inclined to have a spirit type of thing worked up as a, as a companion in that regard, rather than having an undead. Um, because at least as of right now, the nethermancer spell list doesn't have the create undead stuff that early versions of it had with the create skeletons and, and create cadaver men. Yeah. Um, it's got, it's got less of that currently in, in, in their spell kit and dealing more with spirits. Yeah. But we'll see what the future holds. But as of right now, no. So the future um, holds that we are going to wrap this episode up. <laughs> So there's no more future for this one. We're done. We've hit our end of yep. the masks. As, as of this re- recording, <laughs> as of the recording of this episode, there are actually still just still a little bit less than 48 hours left in the Empty Thrones Kickstarter. But by the time this episode drops, it will have ended. It ends as of July 31st. So um, we had beaten our final stretch goal of $30,000. Um, well so done. there will be a digital map of Iopos that will be created and released. Nice here in in the not too distant future um so i need to, print it, you to print it yourself. finish up a couple of things but yeah that's the that's that's where things are so send us an email Absolutely. if you'll want to ask a question or make a comment edsgpodcast at gmail.com earth at earth on g for the podcast twitter feed at metaxas for me at something it. for dan I noticed that you are actually, I saw you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I followed it because I'm like, we at, need to boost at voice underscore voice. Yes. Is your, is your Twitter handle. So people can, can follow that. And I don't know that you actually tweet much, but there's yeah, that. Uh, Facebook, the Discord, podcast. forums. Um, yeah. So you can find us, you can ask questions. Um, we'll be here. And all of that stuff. We're not going away anytime soon. So until not planning on it. the next episode, it's time for you to go mask your own legend. Good night, everybody.